Now let's actually brighten up the mood a little bit uh, with the return of Paul Dupont. I'm back. Yes, yeah, so, here I am. So, Paul, I think uh, a lot of our viewers and listeners really want to know uh, where have you been? Well, your stories, your adventures. Come on, my friend, tell us. Tell us the great adventures of Paul Dupont because you, you you were in a lot of different places. I've been even in the great state of Michigan. Even in the great state of Michigan, I've been doing some traveling. Yeah, so I spent uh, I spent eight weeks out of the country. I was uh, six weeks in Kenya, um, and then two weeks in Greece, uh, covering different stories. So. Kenya is an interesting one. Uh, I went there to to do a little bit of video work and um, cover some of the uh, missionary activities that actually my parents do. My parents are missionaries in this sort of remote area in Kenya on the border with Uganda. And uh, it's crazy to see uh, the advancements in a community like that. I went five years ago to see what they were doing. And just for context, this is an area where 25 years ago, this was a semi-nomadic people group, right? You're running around trying to find which river is flowing at any given time so that you can get water. You're not really building houses for permanent stay. And there's very little agriculture going on, constant warring with tribes. Back, you know, uh, 30 years ago, you had Idi Amin in power in Uganda who was arming uh, some of the, the, the tribes that were bordering the Pakat people. And so there were just you know constant gun battles and stealing of cattle back and forth and all of a sudden you have the installation you know the government takes away guns from the tribal leaders and from the communities so that they can't fight each other anymore and you've got humanitarian groups that go in and put in wells and all of a sudden when you have an a reliable source of water now people can settle now people can begin growing maize and having some amount of agriculture and begin trading, you know, cattle and things like that with a, a lot more uh, confidence in the reliability of their uh, lifestyle. Um, and infant mortality rates begin to drop and things like that. So to have watched a lot of this progression, there's been so much change in this community just in the last five years. Uh, five years ago, I went there. We rented a car in, from Nairobi, and we drove down there. There's a, a church and a primary school and these wells, and we were kind of helping you know, make some improvements and repair some of these wells and things like that. The car that we came into town on was the only motor vehicle I saw for the two weeks that I was there. Like, it was an anomaly. This time around, there were other vehicles. There's actually, there are government trucks that are going back and forth collecting sand for road construction. Um, a lot of the residents uh, have motorcycles. They operate them like uh, taxi services. They call them picky pickies. Oh, really? Um, okay. Uh, one of the projects my parents have been working on is starting a secondary school. So this uh, primary school has started to gain some notoriety in Kenya for being one of the best primary schools uh, to graduate from, to the, to the point where they're getting students that come from neighboring villages. A lot of schools in Kenya are uh, boarding schools. Um, and as a result of the primary school doing well, they st started a secondary school. So they've just got their, they call it Form 1, that's sort of the freshman year high school um, the first class just finished, and they're moving on to their sophomore year, Form 2. Um, and so the and construction of buildings is continuing to go on. And a lot of this effort is, is to help bring education for the people in the area because this is basically an uneducated people group. This is sort of the first generation of children that are getting full formal education. Despite the fact that it's the law of the land in Kenya to educate people, it is not necessarily commonplace everywhere, right? Yeah, you legally you have to send your kids to school, but nobody's going to make you. Nobody's going to go. You're not going to get fined. You're not going to get a you know slap on the wrist. A lot of this is a this is a very very different culture where people don't want to send their you know too many of their children to school because how are they going to pay for all of that? You know, keep the boys back so that they can you know herd the cattle. Don't send the girls to school because. An educated girl can't be sold for bride price as much as an uneducated girl. That's just the culture that you're dealing with. You know, very, very patriarchal, um, polygamist culture. Um, uh, so working in conjunction with my parents, they're obviously coming at it from a, a religious point of view. So they work a lot with the church and do a lot of um, Bible teachings and things like that. And I, I don't uh, share the same... Uh, spirituality. So 
I, I have a lot of questions for, you know, what they do. So one of the things that, that gets me is, yes, you're telling people that it's not good to have multiple wives. And I agree with that. But how do you justify that biblically? Like, that's not a thing. Like, there's certainly a lot of people in the Bible who have multiple wives, and it's not exactly condemned anywhere in the Bible. Yeah. I guess you can convince people that it's in there, but it's not really in there. And it's not really. I think a lot of people use the Second Testament. I, I, in the I New Testament or whatever, yeah. The New Testament as the standard rather than the Old Testament. Because in the Old Testament, there's there's a lot of polygamy. Yeah. It, there's a lot. So my question is, so you, you said it was a five-year gap too when you went there the first time. So infrastructurally, like you said, there's a few cars. They have some motorcycles. That, that's new. What else, what else was new infrastructurally? Um, so a few new buildings. The, one, of the, one of the big things that was new since the last time I was there, most of the, there are 11 wells in the region. And the closest well to where the, the church building is um, had been a hand pump well. Most of the wells are hand pump, um, which has the drawback of not being very mechanically reliable. It requires a lot more repair when you have a hand pump well versus when you have an electrically driven centrifuge well. Those last longer. Um, and so the main well for right, right near the church and the primary school has been converted into a solar centrifuge well with a water tower. So there actually are faucets there now. So people can go and turn on faucets and fill up you know, the water that they need to take back to their to their homestead, which is it's awesome. That wasn't there uh, before. The secondary school being built is new uh, since in the last five years. Even the church building, when I went last time, I uh, was sleeping in, I set up a tent in the church building because it was literally a cinder block building with no doors and no windows. Like holes for doors and windows, but not, nothing physical there. The church now has doors. <laughs> it now has windows. Um, and they have a congregation of about, I would I'd say about 300 uh, that show up on on Sundays, and that's a that's an interesting cultural affair. You think of you know church in the United States is like, if it goes over an hour, people are like, how long is this going to be? Church in Kenya is an all day affair. It's it is nine o'clock through supper time, you know, all day. Is there? I know five years really isn't a lot for like a human cultural development. But was there anything different in how people were acting, things of that nature? Yeah. Um, so. Five years ago, you still had a lot of people who would uh, talk about themselves as as though they were warriors, people who still wore the traditional warrior garb, a lot of uh, arguments and discussions about what should we as a tribe do uh, with regard to punishment for such and such an action, or how how do we convince, you know, we don't want to send our children to school, Was there's a lot more opposition to that. And this time around, I see people that I had met five years ago are now talking very positively about um, the school, and they, they now are starting to see the fruits of some of you know their sons and daughters who have been able to go to college uh, as a result of having good schooling and are bringing back. Um, so one girl in particular is, is going to be coming back to the region. She's studying to be a nurse, and she wants to start a clinic because there's no real hospital or clinic um, in, the, in the region at all. I mean, it's a... If you need to get to the hospital, you need to find somebody who has a motorcycle to take you there because it would be a, a you know five hour walk, and you know if you're dying, that's not going to happen. So yeah. getting a ride is necessary. Are, are there um, is is there anyone in that community that's still holding on to the traditions, like not embracing? Certainly, them? yeah. There's still conflict. There's still cultural conflict between sort of the the old way that they want to, you know, honor the dead, and it's like, hey, maybe you shouldn't be touching dead bodies like that because it's not very sanitary. And then, yeah. you know, newer uh, types of thinking and education. And th- the church actually is playing a huge role in uh, sort of molding that culture into something that can be self-sustaining. Um, and I think it's something that a lot of people are still sort of getting used to, um, this sort of how do you how do you create markets that can self-sustain themselves um, and bring sort of prosperity and well-being into the area um, that is pretty desolate, all things considered. Like, it's one of the businesses that I had seen getting started I thought was really interesting. Um, There's a businessman that sells uh, reduced agave uh, nectar, right? So uh, for use in soaps and things like that, manufacturing. And there are agave plants in the area. So they'll collect 
the the nectar and they'll boil them down in, in steel drums and then let it dry they basically pour it over dry sand um, and let it harden and then the sand sort of falls off and they sell that to the manufacturer um, it's not pulling in lots of money but by American standards I mean they're making like six dollars for a day's work split amongst however many people but that is now an industry that they are taking part in and it's helping them to be self-sustaining to buy the tools necessary for repairing the wells when they break down um, it's helping them to uh, bring in additional food and bring in additional livestock into the areas to uh, make sure that you know people have a, a good standard of living it's it's crazy to see the the progress this community has had over the years um, one of the things that I it's not the focus of my work. The video is really focusing on the the mission efforts uh, that are going on there with the church and whatnot. But one of the questions that I always have is, to what degree is an can an outsider come in and say, hey, doing it this way might be better? Have you guys tried doing this, that, or the other? You know, And when does interfering with culture become detrimental to the society? When do they... When do the people of the area really take ownership over the direction that they want their society to go in versus becoming dependent on those that are coming and basically bringing stuff? And that's a very, very hard question, and it's, and it's, it's weird to see sort of firsthand, um, yeah, okay, we're, we're coming in and, and bringing guidance and we're you know, helping and saying you can do things this way or that way. At what point are we beginning to create dependency and is this not going to be able to be a self-sustaining structure? It's very, it's a very fine line that you walk um, between trying to go into an area and say, um, you need to ha have people that are educated. You need to have people who can, you know, overcome engineering hurdles and uh, learn about healthcare and learn about agriculture. At the same time as saying, hey, maybe you shouldn't continue to participate in some of these old traditions like female genital mutilation like or female circumcision that's kind of not a good thing yeah like that's a thing you kind of want to put your foot down and say this is not a good thing but how do you get that culture to own that yeah so what's what's actually happening i guess on the national level for, for the government to try and you know rebuild or not not rebuild but build a stronger infrastructure so there could be perhaps more outreach and perhaps develop these uh communities that are now starting to settle down um Kenny has a, a is a very very different uh, place in, in terms of its political structure, and there were some some big things that were happening uh, politically while I was there. There are a huge number of tribes and sub tribes. There's twenty some tribe, very tribal country, um, and there are huge differences in how people live, and there there's a lot of um, inter tribal conflict, uh, and that seeps its way into the national politics. So one thing about Kenya is, first of all, they're under a new constitution. Uh, that's only a few years old, so there's there's a lot of argument over what is and isn't constitutional. They just had a really difficult election where there was a lot of alleged fraud uh, on one party, but then the other party also is not squeaky clean either. And there's a lot of argument over the constitutionality of the re-election and all that whole Odinga and uh, Rilo Odinga and uh, Uhuru Kenyatta election was a mess, and that the re-election was happening while I was over there. With regard to remote areas like the Pakat region, that you, those usually get used as political props in Nairobi. Um, and this area already has, because they've, they've got, you know, uh, tablet computers and a little server that they're doing, they put their textbooks on that. And so here's this very remote region that has some technology that they're using to great effect. That's been propped up as a huge win for Nairobi and the central government, even though they had basically nothing to do with it. And this is one of the things that when starting a nonprofit like this where they're starting a secondary school, you kind of have to be aware of the fact that if your school becomes successful, the government will just take it from you. Oh. It will they, no – yeah, wait, they'll wait, claim wait. it as their own win. And so, so they have the power to, to, to take yeah. it. They'll just turn it into a public school and say, you know, thanks for all the infrastructure and work that you put in, but we're going to take all the credit for it. And that's that's a reality that – you know, the nonprofit knows, right? They know that that's going to happen if they're successful in starting a self-sustaining school that is turning out students that are educated and are able to go on to college or university and, 
either come back to their region and build it up or uh, work in Nairobi. The government will take credit for that and take over the school. Now, I think for a lot of our viewers and listeners who are hearing this, we actually you actually sent us a podcast in which you interviewed uh, what was Julius he? Sawe. Julius Sawe. So he's and the pastor of the church in this uh, community of Asilong. Right, and and it's actually uh, up on the Harlands Media YouTube channel mm-hmm. and Facebook page. So if anyone wants to check that out later, they can hear your interview. But why don't you just uh, refresh our memories about what, the, the purpose of that interview? One, how did you get a chance to interview him? And mm-hmm. Uh, just tell us a little bit of uh, the, the background uh, to that. So Julius is um, living in Asilong. He's a Kenyan native who's not from the Asilong area, but his uh, tribal native language is very similar to the Pakat, so he's able to work really well with them. I interviewed him because uh, I wanted to get – he's one of the people we were working with in the region, but while I was there, a lot of this that was going on with the Odinga uh, Kenyatta election um, – I thought mirrored a lot of other elections around the world, even the 2016 election here in the U.S. You've got this sort of outside candidate um, that's alleging fraud on the part of the incumbent and some of this sort of populist versus um, incumbent fight that was happening. And I basically was asking him to shed a lot of light on, you know, fill in some of the gaps in my knowledge. So if you look at that interview, um, he, he really succinctly puts down from a, a Kenyan's point of view, what's going on in, in, in the political sphere. And I think what the real attitude was that, yeah, this Odinga guy is an outsider and he may have some points that things were not entirely on the up and up. But first of all, it's a very tribal culture and tribes sort of vote along tribal lines. And because they're of the same base tribe as Kenyatta, they support Kenyatta and not Uhuru. Or, so it's a little Odinga. like Democrats and Republicans, so to speak. A little bit, yeah, but literally racial tribal guidelines. So much more intense than yeah, yeah. Okay. even so, more intense than so, that. So, so there, there'll, there'll never be like somebody from another tribe voting for somebody else from another tribe, then or you, you have tribal alliances, yeah. right? So, um, yeah, that's it's votes happen on tribal lines in that way. But more than that, what most Kenyans were really concerned about was this was a re-election. They had already had this election, and then there was calls that there was impropriety in the election and so they did a re-election and there were still further calls of you know undermining the political process and at some point one of Kenya's major um, uh, economies is tourism like if you continue to have political unrest if there continue to be um, riots and and disruption of the schooling system and you know tourism is down like this hurts the economy let's we just have to resolve this we just want this to be over that was the general sentiment of people in kenya was let's just whoever wins it doesn't matter just make it make it stop this has to be over so in that case um what were what what was the um what what effects were the were yeah let me me say this again what effects were the elections having on people you said there's some rights like can you a little more into that and what voter what what election proprieties were happening where is it can you go into that a little bit and uh then so you said for tourism how big is tourism as part of their uh i guess gdp uh i don't know as a percentage of gdp but i know it's it's a substantial portion of it if you think of people going to kenya to go on safari and things like that that's a um that's a pretty big sector for uh for kenya um the election impropriety was stuff that you could easily see in the public, things like the, the Constitution called for um, polling stations to be staffed and uh, by, by advertisements and papers, and anyone could apply to be a polling staff. Well, they just didn't do that. They, the incumbent government staffed all the polling stations with their own people and just ignored that part of the provision. Okay, so that they didn't do that right. That's pretty obvious they didn't do that right. But still, the sentiment of the country was, let's just get this over with. Who cares? All right. So yeah. they finally had enough. They wanted to get it uh, settled. Now, the thing is, uh, right next door to Kenya, there was also another huge Zimbabwe. Uh, po- yeah, political movement that happened. That was the removal of President Robert Mugabe, who has been, who's been in power for, what, 30-plus years mm-hmm. in, in that country. Um, at least to, to where you, you were at, what was the reaction from the people in Kenya? What was the political uh, fallout that you saw uh, from that uh, 
coup that happened to President Robert Mugabe. Right. So that happened just in the last few days I was in Kenya. Right. Um, and I remember the general sentiment of folks was basically like, well, that was a long time coming. <laughs> uh, and it, I mean, it's funny. Mugabe, the whole situation is weird because in his later years as president, you know, he came to power in a, a way that um, a lot of the uh, the black African population of Zimbabwe really liked. Yeah. And then a lot of the uh, colonialist white Zimbabwe population was pushed out in a major way. Yeah, because just, just for everyone to understand that, uh, during, for, for a long time, Zimbabwe, similar to uh, South Africa at the time, had a white apartheid-type government. Mm -hmm. And, of course, with governments like that, it's quite clear that the minority of the population, which is usually the descendants of the white colonists, had a lot of power. And the majority of the population, which was basically all the people who lived in Zimbabwe, you know, for, for many generations, had zero power. So when Mugabe came into power, a lot of people were very happy about that. And I remember reading very recently that um, there had been a number of uh, uh, of those colonists that had been killed at in some, I don't know, it was a farming, something that they had. Yeah. And the government was just like, we're not going to look into it. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, and they really messed up the farming actually after the transition because th there was a farming in infrastructure that was able to feed everyone, and the new government really didn't implement it properly, and, and there were there were problems there. Like this, this was not a rocky road, and it's, it, it, but it's also not clear cut one way or the other. Um, when Mugabe came out of power here just this last year, it had become clear that he just had become very uh, established. And wanted to perpetuate his own reign, and it was his his was like, wife what, that he had positioned as the VP, and really was going to be the next president. And finally, it was the military that stepped in and said, "Uh, uh, uh." Yeah, because because he was like go, going like what he was ninety one, ninety two years old. I mean, there, there, over there come, that he was old. Yeah, I mean, there, there, there comes a point to where you're at at that age. You know, there's only so Time many new ideas torch. that yep. that you can have. You have to step down. I mean, mm -hmm. it's 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 unreasonable. And especially like no, like people like you said, people liked him for certain. He had won the respect of the, by how he got into power. His legacy seemed to really be keeping his base together. But like everyone hated his wife. Yeah, um, mm -hmm. I think there was a couple stories out a while ago where she would be very abusive towards. Like the servants in her household and uh, other like people, just you know, she, she, yeah, she, she was not well liked, and yeah. when it became clear that she was positioned to be the next president, and there was going to be no way around it, that sort of forced the hand of the military to say, "Now we need to we need to start a new chapter here." And it's interesting that they don't, they never felt the need to rise up in that way before. Everything kind of was going fine, but when that was that loss of power, and that basically the military plays kingmaker. And it, it, that is that way in, in a lot of uh, African countries. Um, and that's – it doesn't actually signify a major sea change in Zimbabwe's politics to me. Well, uh, here's hoping that at least uh, there's some reform uh, for Zimbabwe and also, again, for, for the political future for, for Kenya too. Because, mm -hmm. man, that interview that you did, it really shed a light on to uh, really what's happening in that country and the long-term consequences of – you know, uh, tribal conflicts as well as political conflicts. There's still repercussions of that uh, election. Just this last week, there was a, a group that supported the um, the opposition party. Mm -hmm. um, there were riots and people that were arrested that, for basically being politically disruptive. Was that nationwide, or was that just in that was in that was in a place just outside Nairobi, I believe. Okay. Um, and it's, I mean, there's definitely political unrest uh, in Kenya that is going to be persistent. And one of the things that came about that, you know, uh, this most recent one, is the government shut down all the media. They shut down all the news stations and everything. And I think it's like, okay, you got to keep news going. Like, Didn't just, the UN just order them to uh, not do that? Yeah. yeah. I think, and I, it was closed for like three days, I think. I think they've they've started news media again. But my, my experience with Kenyan news media uh, is that it's very, very surface level, and it seems very controlled. Is it more or less shallow than Fox, MSN, CNN? I more, I think. Here's an example. So Odinga was coming back from the United States after the election, 
And there was all this talk of, oh, there are going to be riots at the airport when Odinga comes back. Oh, don't go to Nairobi. Don't go to the airport. Don't riot. There's going to be riots. Look out. It's like, what was – who did he meet with in America? Who was he talking to? Why did he go – where was I he in see. America? Why didn't you talk about that? Well, who – what? Who does he know there that he's talking to? Well, oh, but riots. Mean, look yeah. out for the riots. Look That's out, the whole story. Well, well, it, it's, it, it's a story we've heard time and time again mm-hmm. from established media, you know. Yeah, you always got to look into the bigger picture of mm-hmm. why is why is certain subjects being talked about, why it's being covered. You know, yeah. you know what that reminded me of? What? Uh, when Obama got into office and Fox News thought the most important thing to show was Bush in his helicopter going back to Texas. Mm-hmm. Well, hey, you know, he was on a big helicopter ride. They always show that, though, right? The <laughs> outgoing president flying away on the helicopter? Not the entire trip. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> yeah, you they showed the entire trip. In, instead, of, uh, instead of the inauguration, yeah, this was like a... Trump empty podium to Bernie talking on a uh, to thousands of people type of yeah, yeah. priorities. That, that's priorities. interesting though. So in in your again you had a five year gap. You have to see only really two fixed points over a short period of time. Mm-hmm. How do you see the progression of this village and the whole country? And I guess since we're talking about Zimbabwe, throw that in too. <laughs> Those are three pretty disparate topics, but I think for uh, Asilong and for the Pakot region, I think we're going to continue to see. There's talk of, of upgrading the roads there. We're going to see an increased infrastructure spending. Uh, we've, they've gotten the attention of their governor, um, and I think you're going to see more attention to that village and that area being paid to by the local government, and that's going to help foster growth and help foster um, the people to, to really become self-sustaining. And that's really the end goal is to have a, a community that can really ha- have some th- a foundation to build on. Uh, with Kenya as a whole... Um, they, it's tough. They clearly they have a lot of influence from the United States. So there's a lot of there's a lot of military training that takes place in Kenya, and and there's a lot um, that keeps a select group in power, um, to the detriment I think of the larger overall society. And I think part of their national identity is being so tied up in in the in tribal identity. It, I, f- I view as a hindrance toward um, having a more egalitarian approach to governance, uh, and that's going to be a cultural hurdle that needs to be overcome. And I don't think that it can necessarily be done politically. Um, and I think it will. Um, you're, I think it's you're going to see it stalled out political process there. And I think that's similar to what you see in a lot of African countries with regard to Zimbabwe. It's yeah, there was a coup. It made some headlines, but it doesn't represent an actual sea change in the way that country is going to be run in the in the short term future. All right, man. Well, uh, that's definitely a, an interesting note, Paul. We are mm-hmm. really glad to have you back. Thank you for at least you know sharing your time there in mm-hmm. Kenya. Definitely, we want to follow up too with your experience in Greece. But we're going to have to enter into our short break and then we enter into the second hour of hard lens media so uh to all our listeners you are listening to hard lens media uh radio show on q4 radio uh we live stream on our facebook page and we start on q4 radio every saturday from 11 a.m to uh, 1 p.m central standard time and so you can also listen to us uh on on q4 radio.org that's www.qe4.org or if you like what we do uh, here at Harlands Media, we have a Patreon page. So your support, it's the main heart and backbone to, to what we do here. It helps us out produce more content and have more interviews and to do this show. So uh, please support us. Uh, check us out. And we're going to enter into our second break. So stay tuned. We'll be back in like a few short minutes. Peace, everyone. Hard Lens Media.